Thank you, Kathy. Our next speaker is Will Potter. He is an award-winning independent journalist based in Washington, D.C., who focuses on eco-terrorism, the animal rights and environmental movements, and civil liberties post 9-11. Will's work has appeared in publications including the Chicago Tribune, the Huffington Post, and Vermont Law Review. And he has testified before the US Congress about his reporting. His new book, Green is the New Red, an insider's account of a social movement under siege, was recently published by City Lights Books. It has been featured by NPR, Mother Jones, and Publishers Weekly. And Kirkus Book Reviews awarded it a Kirkus Star for Remarkable Merit. Please help me welcome Will Potter. Good evening. So I gave a talk, I think it was in this room in 2006, which seems like a really long time ago now, and a lot has happened since then. And it was right before the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act was going to be passed. And remember, Alex made space at the very last minute to allow me to talk a little bit about that. And my comments were focused as a bit of a warning of the importance of this legislation, not just for people in the room, but for other social justice movements as well. I mean, to use a very non-animal rights analogy, I said that everyone here and everyone in this movement were really the canaries in the mine, that the tactics that you all have experienced for quite a long time and other social justice movements are experiencing in a magnified way now exist to spread. That's their intention. So what I wanted to do today is to give a bit of an expansion of that analogy because the circumstances that we're operating in, I would argue, have expanded quite significantly since that time as well. I had the fortune recently of being overseas um, for a book tour through Europe, and it was an incredible experience for me to be able to meet activists in so many other countries and to see firsthand and to learn firsthand about campaigns and also about tactics of government repression that we never hear about here. Even if you seek out this information, there are language barriers and other obstacles to learning what's going on. And I've talked about this in the past, but it became striking to me in a very new and very, uh, a much more concrete way how identical all of these tactics actually are. Speaking to activists in Austria, whose case is identical to the case of Stop Hunting and Animal Cruelty, a group of activists who were convicted for an effective campaign against a multinational corporation. These effective activists in Austria were wrapped up in a similar case charged with conspiracy facing terrorism charges. They found out in that case that US FBI agents and UK counterterrorism officials actually had traveled to Austria to brief them about this. So this is an example of the kind of direct coordination that's going on. That the FBI documents that Ryan was talking about, the tactics that Dara was talking about, these are directly being communicated internationally. But there are other examples that aren't so concrete. In Spain last year, excuse me, last year I talked about what was going on in Spain, <laughs> I wish I was in Spain last year, <laughs> emphasizing the, the backlash against undercover investigators that have been incredibly effective. Now we're seeing some similar things happen in Finland. In Germany when I was there, I got to learn about how government counterterrorism reports are including anarchists, anti, uh, animal rights activists, and environmentalists. These are all the same things you've been hearing about at this conference and hopefully elsewhere for quite a long time now. In the US, these tactics are spreading to other social movements. As Heidi was discussing with the rise of the Occupy movement, there's been an equally rapid and forceful backlash against this movement. Just last week, there were a series of raids in Olympia, Seattle, and Portland against people that are being labeled as anarchists. The search warrants in those raids listed a number of things, including black clothing and, quote, anti-government and anarchist literature. Again, this is the same tactics that have been used against this movement for quite a long time. Similarly, there's now a grand jury that was convened this week in Seattle 
that much like they've been used against animal rights and environmental activists, they're a fishing expedition to try to gain information about activist political beliefs and political associations. Jordan Halliday is an animal rights activist who just served about 10 months total in prison for his principled stand, refusing to cooperate in any way with the political witch hunt. It should be a point. That carries a special resonance then to these activists as they're facing this grand jury in Seattle. They've seen what's happened. They've seen what's at stake. They've seen Jordan face not only civil, civil but criminal contempt charges. The first time that's happened in this country in over 30 years. And now they see it coming to their front doors and to their movements as well. Fortunately, we're seeing the same kind of solidarity as we've seen in this movement in resisting grand juries. Everyone that's received a subpoena has refused to cooperate in any way. One individual went into the grand jury room to state her name and then was promptly dismissed and was re-subpoenaed again, and she made a public statement that she's not going to cooperate. So what do we take from this? What do we take from the spread of these tactics internationally and how this is spreading to the Occupy movement? In my opinion, I think we really need to shift our understanding and how we talk about what's going on. I think we have to move from what it has historically on the left been to talk about state repression to what is actually going on of corporate repression. These tactics have originated by corporations. As Heidi has, was documenting in her speech, the state is an agent in this. State, local, and federal government, state, local, and federal law enforcement. But they're not the originators. This term eco-terrorism was created by corporate think tanks. The ag-gag legislation is being drafted and introduced and lobbied for by corporations. In some cases, we've seen actual direct communication between corporations and prosecutors, such as in the Shack case. There were emails sent to the prosecutors. Now, I don't do that just to mince words. I think we have to understand what that actually means. Because in the world in which we live, under globalization, under neoliberalism, corporations have no boundaries. They have no restrictions. They travel freely in the pursuit of their profits. And as they travel and as they pursue profit, they bring their tactics with them. So in some cases, when we have this direct communication between US and international law enforcement, it's not always necessary, because other countries are seeing what's going on here, and other activists are seeing what's going on here. So being able to see those direct, concrete relationships and the spreading of these tactics reinforced to me the nature of this corporate repression, and it also reinforced to me how these external factors are either furthered or thwarted by our internal responses. So while this corporate repression I'm describing is going on around the world, the animal rights movement in other countries is dealing with the same infighting and the same divisions as the movement is here. In multiple cities, everywhere I went, it seems there was someone who raised the issue of, well, how do you propose working with people who are welfareist or reformers? Some people went so far as to challenge whether the increased popularity of vegan bakeries overseas and vegan restaurants was actually detrimental because all these new vegans and new uh, celebrities and Ellen going vegan, they're not hardcore animal rights activists. At the same time, and sometimes in the same lecture, you could have people speak up and condemn a different group of people for being too radical, to condemn the Sea Shepherds, to condemn who, uh, at the time, Paul Watson was facing extradition uh, to Costa Rica, and now he is on the run, as we learned a couple weeks ago. So you have these... <laughs> applaud that as well. So, constantly, you're either too welfareist and too reformist, or you're too radical. Similarly, last week, after these raids, I actually started seeing comments online critical of the people who were raided and who were facing grand juries and critical of my work in talking about this as being, quote, liberal. Because in reporting on this, I talked about people's rights. And rights, through a more radical critique, 
our creation of the state, and we should be you know, abolishing the state. I'm not saying I disagree with that, but I am saying that if anyone, I hope you never find yourselves in a courtroom facing any of these types of repression, but if you are, I hope to God you talk about your rights. But still, it's this constant, relentless infighting to pick on one another for you're never radical enough or you're always too radical. This weekend, you're probably going to hear a lot of these debates, and you should. In many cases, there are debates that should be had. But I think the point of my presentation tonight is less to talk about the specifics, about what's going on, which we can talk about at greater length. There are people here with the Occupy Movement as well that can talk about some of these entrapment cases in Cleveland, the entrapment in Chicago, the surveillance. But I'm here to remind you that tonight, no matter how intense these internal debates may become, no matter how intense they may feel to you and to everyone around you, and to the small group of people that are in this room, your opposition doesn't care. We see this in the FOIA documents through Ryan, through Center for Constitutional Rights and many other groups. They include information on PETA and they talk about media campaigns. Training documents that are received from the American Civil Liberties Union discuss the FBI's presentations to other FBI agents about anarchists. They don't talk about the black bloc and burning things down. They say that anarchists are, quote, criminals seeking an ideology. This is what's at stake. It's the criminalization of an entire belief system. A couple weeks ago, I found an email in my inbox from the Animal Agriculture Alliance, who had a campaign through their entire organization against the Bank of America, because Bank of America had an HSUS credit card. These aren't isolated cases. Repeatedly, you see that the focus of these industry groups, of the National Association for Biomedical Research, the Cattlemen's Association, the Animal Agriculture Alliance, every group that you can think of, the fur industry, they don't just talk about the Animal Liberation Front, and they just don't, don't talk about the so-called radicals. They talk about the Humane Society, they talk about PETA, they talk about Mercy for Animals, they talk about Compassion Over Killing, they talk about every spectrum of this movement. And even further, we obtained some documents recently through the Center for Constitutional Rights that include information on what journalists are doing speaking out against this. Particularly, we found quite a few pages about my book and lectures, lectures at this conference. Time and again, in FBI files and industry documents, it's clear, they don't care. To them, the totality of this movement is what constitutes a threat. It's not just the undercover investigators. It's not just the Animal Liberation Front. It's not just the Humane Society. It's everyone. They want to destroy all of it together. So as this infighting continues to increase, I think we would all do well to take a breath and ask ourselves, who do you actually have more in common with? Is it Pfizer and Wyeth and GlaxoSmithKline? Is it the FBI and Homeland Security? Is it the pork producers and the Cattlemen's Association and everyone behind these ag-gag bills? Is it Chick-fil-A? Or is it the person sitting next to you? It strikes me that too often we're using scalpels when we should be using sledgehammers. We're using scalpels against each other, trying to excise the bits and the slivers with which we disagree. All movements do this, but there's something about the animal rights movement that seems to fetishize this quest for purity and take it out exceptionally hard on each other. To be clear, I'm not asking you all to hold back, and I'm not asking you all to hold hands or to sing songs. <laughs> Speak your peace, say what's on your mind, hold your friends accountable, hold them more accountable than your enemies. My comments are not motivated by some kind of hippie sing-along, this is pragmatism. This is self-preservation. These corporate tactics thrive on division. They depend on division, and we've gotten so wrapped up in our own passions that we've lost sight of that. Activists in other countries have not, though. They may be wrapped up in their own infighting, but they see what's going on here. Everyone knows about the debates that are, being going, that are taking place in the United States, and everyone over there is watching this corporate repression to see how we respond. So as you move forward this weekend and go back home, don't shy away from critiquing your friends. Hold them accountable, but focus your strength outward 
not against your friends and allies who are fighting with compassion, but outward against those who want nothing more than the complete destruction of the entire movement. No matter how significant these differences feel, no matter how outraged and frustrated you may get with one another, remember it's all for nothing unless you turn that rage outwards. Put down your scalpels, raise your sledgehammers, and strike hard. Thank you. Yeah.